All right. Welcome everybody to the, this week's uh, ACIM workbook lessons, the Zoom discussion um, from lessons 22 to 28. And uh, I think we'll all just get started with a prayer and then we'll, we'll dive right into the discussion. So the prayer that I like to go to, let me bring it up here over and over again. Okay. So if you'd all like to take a deep breath and just relax, let the tension out. And you can close your eyes if you'd like to. I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do because he who sent me will direct me. I am content to be wherever he wishes, knowing he goes there with me. I will be healed as I let him teach me to heal. Hmm. You can open your eyes and come back at your leisure. We've got Deborah. Hi, Deborah. Good to Hi. see you. Thank you. Good morning. Hey. hey. Hi. And Ardith, we have me and Johanna and Audrey from Canada and Deborah Hi. and Mustafa just showed up. Hi, Hi. Mustafa. How are you? Hi. Doing good. And we've got a new face, Katya, as well. Oh, good. Hi, That's great. All right. Let me kind of bring up my notes here. So if it's all right with everybody, I liked the way that Johanna and Manu have been doing it. Um, so I just sort of took each lesson and I just pulled, uh, you know, a few sentences out that sort of spoke to me. Um, so maybe we can kind of go round robin and, and have people read the lesson and the couple of sentences, and then we can open it up for any thoughts that people have, and we can just kind of take them one at a time. Does that sound good? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let me share my screen here. Okay. Let's see. So um, how about I just, we do the popcorn sort of thing where we, one person reads and they call on the next person. Um, Johanna, would you like to read uh, lesson 22? Sure, lesson 22. What I see is a form of vengeance. Today's idea accurately describes the way anyone who holds attack thoughts in his mind must see the world. Having projected his anger onto the world, he sees vengeance about to strike him. I see only the perishable. I see nothing that will last. What I see is not real. What I see is a form of vengeance. That's the, the text that um, Derek selected for this lesson. And the thoughts that come up for me is what's, it, what's in the back of this um, dynamic is that the mind when it's not thinking with God, projects whatever content is there. And um, the anger and the, the guilt and the fear that we hold projects outward. And we're not, we're not conscious of that. And so the image that we see that speaks of danger and of fear and of attack, uh, it seems directed at us. And so we take proof from the image that our thoughts must be correct. And so we're caught in a loop. And that's, I think, what this lesson is trying to uh, undo for us. I see only the perishable. I see nothing that will last. In other words, why would I invest in it? So uh, that's what I was thinking. And then you have a question there. What's the source of our tech thoughts? Well, that's a, that's a deep question. If we knew all the time that would help yeah i i if i could just ex, like sort of expand on the question that i had um when i was preparing this this morning 
I was looking at the last of the four sentences that says, what I see as a form of vengeance. And, you know, somebody's judging me and I perceive that they're attacking me and, and they're getting back at me and I'm being defensive. Like at that level of projection, you know, I sort of understand that. But going deeper to where, you know, if, if we rejected God or if we killed God in a sense, uh, if we feel that we are guilty at a subconscious level of the, of the ultimate um, bad thing, then that fear, so then fearing that vengeance would be fearing that retaliation from God, if you will, ultimately at all times. And now my question for the group is, is that um, can it be interpreted that what, what I see as a form of vengeance, can that be expanded um, to be everything uh, this, okay, this may not make any sense. So please just tell me if I, I'm off base here, but is everything in form that I see that denies the reality of what I am, denies the reality of God, because I see a shirt and I see a wall and I see separate things. And I, I see all this stuff that is not that is, is form in general, is that a form of vengeance or are they just talking about people that are, you know, judging you and, and attacking you literally? Deborah? I think it is a form of vengeance because it's all our projections and the mm. projections come from the ego when you're trying to protect yourself, your protect your guilt, darkness, you know, all that stuff. But, but I, I think your perception is, in my mind, it's accurate. I second it. Mm. Thank you, because for for that perspective, because when I thought the thought this morning, I, I thought, you know, hey, they're calling me a jerk. Okay, that I can understand, but me going, hey, I'm separate. I, I'm a body. I'm I'm a shirt here. I'm safe in my separateness. The thought that went through my head was that's a form of vengeance too. And I'm like, well, that's a little bit extreme. Um, because it seems so neutral. <laughs> yeah, but it, but it, I think it's true because the the, the, the course teaches that everything was the ego brought everything into exist, made everything, brought ev any everything into existence in order to separate itself. That was the whole point of you know when the mat, the tiny mad idea happened. But the good thing is that right at that moment, the answer was given. So with every neutral thought about a shirt and, and, and an office and, and uh, headphones or whatever, there's two things. There's the symbol of separation, but at the same time, there's the repurpose. And it's up to us to zoom in, to choose and to zoom in on the, re the repurposed part. Mm. Does that make sense? That, that does. Absolutely. But first you have to see that everything is a form of vengeance. Otherwise you don't see the need need to repurpose yeah exactly mm, mm. mustafa Wait, you, were you oh sorry oh yeah. uh, no it's okay um i found this lesson very challenging because you know we always get into confrontations with the people that are closest to us like family members and they don't want to see us for who we are they want to see us as they want us to see us and a lot of time it's attacking so when I was going through this lesson, my dad made a comment I and mean, he hasn't really accepted, <laughs> or let's, let's put it so he's accepted my sexuality, but he's still embarrassed by it. So he's not going to go tell other people. And, you know, one of my nephews, I mean, he's going to get married in the summer. So he said, my husband and I will be the first to come. <laughs> so that was a little bit of an attack from my dad's part, you know. And, and for me, trying to understand this lesson, it's like, okay, being attacked, I'm also projecting this out there. So it was a little bit difficult to read this lesson, but at the same time, I had to step back and say, okay, you know what, I just got to turn it over to God. I got to find peace with this. <laughs> Not make a bigger thing out of it. <laughs> mm. yes, That's think... not easy to do. Not easy. <laughs> but, but I think... And it's, 
the call for for everything that we experience yeah is to, to because we don't know and that's yeah. one of the, the lessons that comes up yeah we don't know what anything is for so you don't know what it is for that your your dad yeah. is the way he is and you don't know what it is for that that, that you're you're in a that you have a husband you don't know what that's for no <laughs> And that's funny because you know you think you do. It's, you know, I have a husband too. I think why, that I know why I have a husband, but I don't. Yeah. So that sort of puts me back in square one. I don't know why I have a husband. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it, it's I, it's a hard lesson, you know, especially with yes. that comment. It's like you know, brewing for a couple of days, <laughs> trying not to be reactive or attacking. It's in the solar plexus. I bet, like yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's been many, many years now, but still it comes out. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, Artis, you had something to say, and then I had a, a comment as well. No, why don't you go ahead? I'll, I'll pop in. Okay. I, I was just going to say um, to Mustafa in the group, I had a question for you all. Um, uh, Derek, yeah, could you unshare? Because then I can see everybody. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I've stretched everybody out so I can see them on my screen, but I could see how the, the share would do that. Where's my stop share? There it is. Yeah, thank you. Oh, Perfect. And I'll, Linda. when we read, I will, uh, hey, Linda, <laughs> I will share to read and then I will unshare so everybody can see everybody because it, it definitely feels better when you connect it that way. Um, my question for Mustafa, Mustafa in the group is, I've gotten hit one twice this week where somebody sent some energy, some judgment at me. Um, objectively, I, I, I don't think that's me just making something up. I think that, you know, neutral observers would probably agree that, you know, somebody was triggered and they, you know, sent a communication my way that I received. It hit me in the solar plexus and I got defensive and I wanted to, you know, attack back. And what I'm there's two different ways that I've been thinking about what to do when that happens. And one of them is to, you know, don't respond, ask the Holy spirit to help me let go of this reaction to see them differently, um, to see it as a cry for help and calm down and, and move back to a space of um, neutrality or loving. That's one way to go about it. And another way I've thought is, something I learned in a, you know, uh, when I was uh, getting a degree in spiritual psychology, which was get out your journal and write down all of your judgments and all the ways you are judging and want to attack them back. Just get it out of your system in the journal first and, you know, and maybe even tear up that paper and burn it. And then you might be in a more neutral space to, to then ask the Holy spirit for further clearing of that. Um, what sort of pro procedures or how do you how do you all deal with it when you get triggered deborah well I, I really appreciate the way you just described it whether it's I think you have to identify your your dark thoughts first mm. yeah, well not first but as part of the process so that's what you're doing when you're journaling you know so because there's that whole part where it's necessary for us to identify our belief systems, you know, what we think about it, just all those things you detailed. Um, I think you can kind of do both. You know, I can say, okay, Holy Spirit, help. I don't know how to deal with this. Let me let it go. Well, oh, sorry. Where? That was me. Okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but at the same time, unless you identify those underlying belief structures, it's probably going to keep repeating. It, you'll, your reactivity, your reactions, because they're so habitual to us and because we believe in them so much, will probably tend to come back. So I think it's the undoing our beliefs that have a, possibly an impact on long term, mm. long term change, you know, but always keep asking Holy Spirit, help me. I don't mm. know how to do this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, thank you. Um, Ardeth? Yeah, I don't know. I think um, part, part that can be real helpful is to concentrate on that. Uh, I see only the perishable. I see nothing that will last. What I see is not real. Um, I get the feeling that, uh, I don't know how to express this. I guess the egoic idea 
about life. Uh, try to try not to make the ego into a being, but remember it's a thought system, but still it's ingrained in us, is how dare this life be only perishable? I mean, seriously, on an unconscious level. Oh, I'm point. separate from God, but why can't we have that eternality? Wow. Why, why does, and I see nothing that will last. Darn it. Mm. What I see is not real. No, it isn't. And so that when something... Um, personal comes up, which happens all the time. I say personal deliberately because that's what the ego thinks it is. Mm -hmm. To depersonalize it as much as possible for one thing and then bring it back and say, okay, in this case, I am PO'd and I'm going to bring it right away to my inner guidance right away. I'm not going to let any time go in mm. between and just keep doing it. It sounds repetitive, I know, but apparently and I've heard from so many of our brothers and sisters that this really does work over time. Mm. It sort of, sort of tamps down our anger meter a lot. So anyway, that wow. would be Thank you. another alternative. Sure. Mustafa. Yeah, I mean, the example that I was also using with my father, it's like he's 82 and he's starting to lose his memory too. So it's like stepping back and being calm about it too and being okay with it you know turn it over to god i mean i constantly have to do that every time i entertain a negative thought it's like okay god take this off my hands yeah johanna oh you're muted johanna you're muted there you go i think that's extremely wise mustafa because then you you stop in your tracks and even if you haven't um written it down or, or or phrased it even in your head you have recognized the quality of it mm. and you've said i don't want any of that and in my experience when i've been able to do that i can't always do it <laughs> when i've been able to do it and then the relief comes when the atonement is there all of a sudden i know i know what was the matter whereas before the atonement i i had a hard time putting my finger on what is it you know what am i doing wrong and where where am i going in the rabbit hole because you know in, in that frantic state you cannot think straight and uh afterwards i'll i'll be able to say okay this is this is the belief that i apparently had and that's causing this this situation that that's not pleasurable for nobody and of course you, at that point you don't know what the re resolution will be eventually or if the situation will change or not it might or might not change um but anyway i find comfort in the idea that i don't have to know it all yeah if i just recognize that this is not something i'm choosing so i'm giving it i'm putting it on the altar and i'm asking for a new way and it gives me goosebumps. can i add one small thing sorry go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, another thing that just kicked on me might help, Mustafa, is um, if you can remember, <laughs> it's not easy, but in the same moment where that anger feeling comes up, just to think to myself, I'm not alone in this, and what I'm thinking and feeling, so is so are all my brothers and sisters. We're one. There is no separation there in reality. And in a sense, it gives comfort and also lets us know, too, that we kind of have a gentle and loving obligation to, as much as possible, put those kinds of things aside. And it kind of, again, it's another way to have us kind of step aside from our own garbage. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, it's just another, another tactic, another way. Um, I don't think there's any one way. I think we, we really do ourselves a service to try a whole bunch of things. As long as we get rid of it, don't let it sit and simmer. I think that's yeah. the biggie. Well, thanks, Arda. Thank you, everyone. Did anybody else have any other thoughts before we move on to the next one, Lesson 23? Um, Johanna, would you like to um, call on whoever you feel called to call on? Oh, she muted again. <laughs> I think you want to talk today. I'm calling, I'm calling, yeah. I'm calling on Linda. Okay, lesson 23. 
I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. The idea for today contains the only way out of fear that will ever succeed. Nothing else will work. Everything else is meaningless, but this way cannot fail. There is no point in lamenting the world. There is no point in trying to change the world. It is inescape, incapable of change because it is merely an effect. But there is indeed a point in changing your thoughts about the world. Here you are changing the cause. The effect will change automatically. The, the idea for today introduces the thought that you are not trapped in the world you see because its cause can be changed. This change requires first that the cause be identified and then let go so it can be replaced. Anybody have any thoughts occurring to them off of that one? Yeah, that, that reminds me of uh, the other group I'm in where she's talking about the new three R's, you know, it used to be reading and writing and arithmetic. And she said in the course, it's um, recognize, release, and replace. And that's basically what this just said. Oh, I like that. Three R's. Right. And that reiterates what you brought up at the beginning, Derek, about identifying. Right, the recognized part. Right. You know, it also really emphasizes how how powerful our thoughts are. I mean, that, that those are really cause, causative. I think, Deborah, that just made me think that uh, just an hour or so ago, um, I perceived myself as being micromanaged by a coworker. And I did three or four things and I got two emails from her going, oh, don't forget this. Or, oh, and I was like, uh, you know, and I'm, don't micromanage me was my response. And, and I, so there's the attack thought. And I got up and walked down the hallway and I immediately was like, oh man, you know, where am I micromanaging myself or others that this is showing up in my world as a projection. So it's in my mind and, and, you know, spirit help, help me release this. You know, I don't want to micromanage people. I don't want to attack her. I don't want to be attracting this. So I just kind of walked the hallway for 30, 40 seconds thinking these thoughts and the way this lesson says that we are not trapped in this world, as we change our thoughts, we change the cause and the effect will change of its, of a, it, it'll change naturally when you change the cause. I came back and five minutes later, I got a random email from this person this morning. She goes, hi, Derek, smiley face. I'm sorry. I don't, I, I, I don't mean to be so controlling. And she totally took responsibility and gave this beautiful, loving response, seemingly for no reason. Mm -hmm. To me, that was an example of, I, I asked that my thoughts be changed. And five minutes later, miraculously, the world showed up in a totally different way, loving instead of micromanaging. Maybe this stuff does work. Yeah, you think? <laughs> Oh, wow, that's good. That's good. That's yeah. really good. Yeah. But what's interesting is that the, the part that Linda just read explicitly says that you have to identify it. Whereas I, I was just saying, well, you know, sometimes I can't. I can't identify it. And so um, I felt a bit bad for having said that. And then, you know, listening to what the workbook lesson actually says. So what do you guys do when you, when you can't identify, even if you write it, try to write it down or you talk to somebody about it and still you can't identify what the belief is that is messing it up? Well, Let go. <laughs> yeah, I try to I, forgive myself and say, look, I'm doing the best I can yeah. and have that little willingness to have it, to, to understand what it is. And just, just sort of say, okay, I did the best I can. Hey. Okay. Artist? Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I think um, at that point, I just let it go. Because if I don't really, if I know automatically, I get a feeling that I, I, I'm not going to be able to figure this out right now. Or it does something that doesn't click. I just let it go because what ends up happening, if I don't do that, then I end up piling thought upon thought. Um, 
and probably going nowhere. And that doesn't help. Uh, by letting it go, we're not being penalized. There's not somebody there with a book taking you know, notes. Ah, she didn't talk about this thought. Ah, she didn't talk about that thought. It's when we know the thoughts and we hear them in our head or we see them or we feel them, give it up right away. Uh, it says, I can escape from the world I see. How? Not by trying to sit there and figure it out, and dot, dot, but by giving up the attack thoughts. So it doesn't mean we shouldn't sit there at some point meditatively, quietly, when we have an opportunity and just kind of find out what, what's going on, just sit silently. Because a lot of times when we just shut up, uh, the answers come. And if they don't, don't worry about it. Don't focus on it. Just work with what you know, and it's incrementally it'll it'll pile up and you'll you'll feel a lot better. I know I do. I never feel good when I put myself through the ringer over not being able to understand what's going on. Helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Hmm. So, uh, Johanna, I've given host to you. So when the whole thing's over with, you, when you close it down, everything will shut down and the recording will stop. It's been so good to be with everybody. I've got a meeting at work, so I've got to take off. Mustafa, oh, no. I would love to hear what you have to say, <laughs> but I've got to take off. Mm -hmm. Good to see you, Audrey. Good to see Bye, you, Derek. <laughs> All right, Bye, see Derek. You Bye. Bye, Artis. Have a good meeting. All right, Mustafa. Yeah, um, I like what Artis said, because it when you're going on that slippery slope, one thought becomes another thought, another thought, and we start developing on it. And if we don't catch ourselves, <laughs> um, we're in trouble. <laughs> it, and I do find that sometimes. The other thing is sometimes I watch how I feel. If I feel like I'm getting like... I can put it irritable, negative, not happy. Then I kind of step back and do something nice for myself. Take care of myself. Um, I, I think you guys have all heard the word halt. Like when you're hung, hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. What was the Reckon word? Halt. 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 H-A-L-T. Oh, halt. Yeah. Oh, halt. Halt. I'm sorry. Halt. Go ahead. Yeah. Halt. 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 So stop. <laughs> right? Stop. Yeah. Hungry. Say it again. Hungry. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Oh, wow. Yeah. So as soon as you can recognize that, I mean, you can stop and just take care of yourself. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Take a break. Always, take a time out. Take a time out. Do something nice for yourself. Go for a walk like Derek does. <laughs> Roll around the hallways. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 40, 40 seconds. It only yeah. took him 40 seconds. Yeah, just to get out of that state. Yeah. Yeah. Snap out of it. Yeah. yeah. And one thing make sure you don't do is listen to that you know what voice that tells you, oh, you're avoiding. You know, go have a, you're going to go have an ice cream. You're going to go do something fun. You know, <laughs> say, in the corner, you, I'm going. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyone, anything else on uh, that lesson? Linda, who are you tagging? Oh, um, well, I guess I'll tag you right back. How's that? I already had a turn. Well, then who didn't? <laughs> sure, I'm still getting to know you all. Let's see. Um, uh, gallery view. All right. So, um, gosh. I see A-U-D-Z, and I'm not sure how to pronounce her name. She's got A-U-D-Z on. Audrey. Audrey, there you go, Audrey. Hello, okay, great, lesson 24. I do not perceive my own best interests. In no situation that arises, do you realize the outcome that would make you happy? Therefore, you have no guide to appropriate action and no way of judging the result. What you do is determined by your perception of the situation and that perception is wrong. It is inevitable then that you will not serve your own best interests. Yet they are your only goal in any situation which is correctly perceived. If you realized that you do not perceive your own best interests, you could be taught what they are. 
but in the presence of your conviction that you do know what they are, you cannot learn. Uh, that's a great lesson. Um, I think for this one, it is ultimately um, taking wax at the belief system we have. And um, I think when you kind of chip away at some of those big ones, there's a little bit of a domino effect that can happen which is wonderful because in that last lesson, when it talked about that, you need to know what, what it is. Like, I'm, I'm not sure I yeah. agree with that because we're just saying here now, we never know what it is because anytime we're thinking, we can be assured that it's not that. <laughs> because we're always thinking with an ego mind until we're not, right? Yep. So I love this so much. I think a big one for me that really got to knock out a lot of beliefs was um, being a parent uh, and a parent to kids 12 years apart. So that was a whole um, interesting experience to go through and just see different in a decade, different ways to parent, you know, all the all the different toys and and do this now we used to say this but no don't do that like everything changes all the time and it was so evident to see that having these two experiences and then recently a few years the whole idea that i had a son an elder son and a daughter but um the daughter is not a daughter. The daughter is a boy. So that really turned things on its head for me because I don't understand anything, any of the things that are being said to me from this other person because I've never had the thought. I've never had the experience. But what I do understand is not about thought. It's about love that I have for this other, other being that is me and, and really is me because I can totally see now things are playing out that have already played out for me. Like it's almost like a corrections are happening as I watch them through, through the, this child. And it's actually quite beautiful it is scary very scary at first to really be turned upside down with that but so much appreciation that I really don't know anything and really understanding that when you when you're just a conservative female that you know it's it's wonderful it is a beautiful experience and I'm grateful for it so I really don't perceive my own best interests in, in most situations. There's a feeling of knowing, um, of not a knowing, but there's when the, the no thought and just the allowing and then the watching of the unfolding, that, that to me is being in the space of the Christ consciousness. And, and, and I love it. And sometimes I'm there and sometimes I'm not. And I love it all. So thank you. It's a very wonderful share, Audrey. I can imagine yeah. that it would tug your heartstrings. Yeah, you turned on its head that line, but in the presence of your conviction that you do know what these things are, you can't learn by opening your heart. Yeah. There was a reason why uh, Linda tagged you huh, for that lesson. So you could tell. So yeah, you could Big tell. Reason. Yeah. Well, another thing that was noticed is that um, the default of this mind is to right away go into what what's wrong. What, in all instances, I started noticing that this 
this past few weeks when anytime somebody would call like the the, the ch children or the, the the husband and it would be what's wrong like right away it's like really that's your default what's wrong how about picking up the phone and saying what's right so just little things like that being vigilant to to the thoughts that are happening and just wow that's an interesting thought I can't believe that and the habitualness of it right so it's just untraining the mind we got to replace it and get in the habit of doing that but we didn't we don't feel I don't feel like I consciously habitualize myself to this so it's like why do I have to fix it why do I have to be vigilant in my thoughts you know there's that <laughs> little bit of strain but just keep going and have groups like this and the course and we're tickety-boo <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that's a big one you know I think I just thought about this when you said that I, you know I'm probably everybody in the universe by now knows that I lost, my furnace went out on me last week and I had to, it was going to be very cold. And I said, what is going on here? What have I done <laughs> right away? You know, it's silly me. And so after sitting very quietly for a bit, I realized <laughs> just allow, accept, welcome, not just allow, welcome. And wow, bingo. Uh, instead of having a, uh, an appointment for a new furnace to be put in, put a, put ahead a two weeks, where I was going to freeze because they were saying the temperatures were going to really go down, way, way down. I got a on the phone call to the guy that was going to arrange the appointment. He says, "Hey, I got an idea. We got an opening tomorrow. Can you do it?" I said, "Can I do it?" <laughs> yes. And when I got the phone call from him, I I realized I I had that thought. What's wrong? I thought they were going to call me. To tell me they can't go in two weeks because out here where I am, they have a lot of older people and they're backed up and all this other stuff. And, I, you know, I stopped myself from going on and on about that. But I had that thought right away and bang. It was just like what Derek was saying. He's had this automatic email from somebody. <laughs> you see your result right away when I was willing to say, well, wait a minute, this maybe isn't what it's about. Bingo. I get a phone call totally the opposite to what I had perceived as going on. So anyway. That's my witness. Anybody want to share something else on this lesson or shall we continue with the next one? Okay, let me share the screen again. I'll peg Mustafa. <laughs> oh <my>. Thanks. <laughs> it's a different document because yeah. There you go. Oh, we just did, did this Yeah, one. we did that one, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so lesson 25. Okay. I do not know what anything is for. Purpose is meaning. Today's idea explains why nothing you see means anything. You do not know what it is for. Therefore, it is meaningless to you. Everything is for your own best interest. That is what it is for. That is its purpose. That is what it means. It is in recognizing that this, that your goals become unified. It is in recognizing this, that what you see is giving meaning. You perceive the world and everything in it as meaningful in terms of the ego goals. These goals have nothing to do with your own best interests because the ego is not you. The false identification makes you incapable of understanding what anything is for. As a result, you're bound to misuse it. When you believe this, you will try to withdraw the goals you have assigned to the world instead of attempting to reinforce them. Another way of describing the goals you now perceive is to say that they are all concerned with personal interests. Since you have no personal interests, your goals are really concerning, concerned with nothing. In cherishing them, Therefore, you have no goals at all, and thus you do not know what anything is for. Uh, before you can make any sense 
of the exercise for today, one more thought is necessary. At the most superficial levels, you do not recognize purpose. Yet purpose cannot be understood at these levels. For example, you do not understand that the telephone is for the purpose of talking to someone who is not physically in your immediate vicinity. What you do not understand is what you want to reach him for. And it is this that makes your contact with him meaningful or not. It is crucial to your learning to be willing to give up the goals you have established for everything. The recognition that they are meaningless rather than good or bad is the only way to accomplish this. The idea for today is to step in this direction. I think that's it. Yeah. I, I this lesson kind of hit home. Um, I think from last week when Derek was talking about the cup, <laughs> and you know when you look at the cup, you really don't know what its purpose is. Um, you think it's yours. You put water in it. You look at it. Might be your favorite cup. But then there's greater meaning, um, even like in terms of the table. You know, there's a table, and we look at it as a table, but there's more to it in terms of its purpose. It could be a purpose for sitting down with everyone, sharing, appreciating. And sometimes we take things for granted. So that's the way I kind of reflect it. I, I love the way he said, you know, you give a cup of water to someone and you're sharing it with someone. So I felt like when I read this lesson, what Derek said last week kind of, Help me to understand that, you know, there's more to than it just being ours, especially in the materialistic work world. It's, uh, there's a mutual benefit for all of us in terms of helping one another, sharing with one another. And that gives it a greater meaning. Yeah, lovely, lovely. Yeah. And it, it, it harks back again to, to the repurposing of everything, right? Yeah. It's the cup, the ego mind made the cup it's a symbol for the separation, but at the same time, yeah. it has a repurpose. And in this case, that could be sharing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that holds for each and every object, each and every situation, each and every person, everything yeah. that happens that we that is right in our faces. Yeah. There's yeah. this choice. Yeah. And, and the things that we have are meant to be used. <laughs> like I, I have a tendency to break things. <laughs> So right. will, <laughs> I have a tendency to break things okay. <laughs> with a glass. <laughs> so my husband will get upset with me and I go, well, it's for you. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> another one, right? No big deal. <laughs> yeah, no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think taking it out of the category of uh, good or bad, uh, it says is the only way to accomplish this, being willing to give up the goals. That's mm. that's the ego's way to uh, always, it's always separate. Everything has got two to it, you know, good, bad, good. And the more that we realize how, and accept the fact, even if it doesn't logically click in the beginning, that it's all meaningless. Uh, I think that backing away from that good or bad I think that's a biggie. I don't know why. I just know when I step back and I observe and stop thinking, stop talking, stop judging and comparing, somehow very often I get complete realization of what's going on. And that doesn't come from ego at all. And it feels so doggone good. No, that I know it's not say good or bad, but it does. Yeah. It feels up. It feels uplifting, and um, that when those instances happen, we realize the value of quiet, the value of stepping aside, <clears throat> and and then it builds up again. It's cumulative. It, we don't even really realize how much how important that is until we do. Yeah. And I think that what you said about um, that even if, you know, the ego wants to label stuff bad or good and why oh, that's yeah. so important. It is important because if you, if you label something as good, there's the temptation to just leave it be. Okay, it's good. And, yeah. <laughs> but, and so you don't dig deeper but, and while you would have to, to get the, to get the real purpose of it. 
Am I expressing myself? I think it's two, two sides of the same coin, I think, in a sense. On yeah. the one hand, yes, you're right. You have to. You can't just throw it away and ignore. You have to dig deeper because otherwise you can't give it up to have it removed. But on the other hand, the, the other side of the quiet side of just refusing to put it in that category. It's, it's kind of a balancing act, and it's a very much on, I, I'm sorry to say, individual basis, but the Course leads us to believe that the whole Course is that way anyhow. So I think if we're patient with ourselves, we'll know what is called for in that moment, whether to go deeper and look it, into it and bring it up, or step back and allow ourselves to be informed quietly. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Linda, go ahead. Well, I am a retired children's librarian, and this all makes me think of the book Fortunately. Fortunately is a book by Remy Charlotte, and it's an old tale where, um, you know, there once upon a time there was a, a farmer who had a son who broke his leg. Oh, that's terrible. No, actually, it's a good thing because when the army came along and they wanted to conscript, you know, the, the men into the army, they didn't have to send their son. And it just goes on and on with something that's <laughs> obviously terrible. And then you find out the reason why is, hey, it actually turns out good. And that means a lot to my life because, you know, we're 65 now and I can look back at the things that were just horrible. And now wow. I can see, you know, yeah. My parents had to divorce or I never would have gotten out of that little town and moved on to do such and such, you know. Uh, oh, that was the most horrible situation I was in there. Yeah, but that really made my study of the course deepen, didn't it? I mean, it's, like I said, we don't know what anything's for. We're in the in the valley. But um, looking back from age 65, you know, things worked out pretty darn good. Somebody was watching over me. <laughs> <laughs> Good story. What, what do you say? What yeah. it was called? Look for the children's book called Fortunately. Fortunately. The guy's first name is R E M Y, Remy, and his last name is Charlotte, C H A R L I P, based on an old tale, and it's just wonderful. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah. It, it, it brings the point home. It does. Yeah. Does any, anyone have another? insight regarding this lesson and who are you tagging Mustafa I don't know her name it's this foundation for inner peace <laughs> Deborah yeah. Deborah sorry Deborah <laughs> yeah. uh, let me share my screen again there we Deborah. go sorry about that I didn't know I had put it up that way okay lesson 26 my attack thoughts are attacking my invulnerability it is surely obvious that if you can be attacked, you are not invulnerable. You see attack as a real threat. That is because you believe you can really attack. And what would have effects through you must also have effects on you. It is this law that will ultimately save you, but you are misusing it now. You must therefore learn how it can be used for your own best interests rather than against them. Because your attack thoughts will be projected, you will fear attack. And if you fear attack, you must believe that you are not invulnerable. Attack thoughts therefore make you vulnerable in your mind, which is where the attack thoughts are. Attack thoughts and invulnerability cannot be accepted together. They contradict each other. The idea for today introduces the thought that you will always attack yourself first. The idea for today introduces the thought that you will always attack yourself first. If attack thoughts must entail the belief that you are vulnerable, their effect is to weaken you in your own eyes. Thus they have attacked your perception of yourself. And because you believe in them, you can no longer believe in yourself. A false image of yourself has come to take the place of what you are. Practice with today's idea will help you to understand that vulnerability or invulnerability is the result of your own thoughts. 
Nothing except your thoughts can attack you. Nothing except your thoughts can make you think you are vulnerable. And nothing except your thoughts can prove to you this is not so. Is that where it ends? Yeah, that's really oh, okay. cool. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, the rest goes into the way to practice it on the oh, day that... Yeah. Right. Gotcha. Um, this is a, a deep one. I don't know quite what to say about it. Um, it. It reminds me of when one feels like a victim, which is being a, that you're attacked. You know, that this person did something bad to me and oh my God, you know, how terrible it is. Like, like the book <laughs> you just referenced, Linda. Um, it always comes back to our thoughts. And I guess it also has to do with what teacher we choose. So if I'm identifying with the ego, then my thoughts will represent that egoic point of view. Whereas if I can shift and identify with the, the, the Holy Spirit as a teacher, then my thoughts, I think, would be different. Um, but I remember times where I felt attacked, but I couldn't get to the part that it was my thoughts that was attacking me. You know, it was always the other person. Um, Johanna, you want to add to that? Well... No, I, I'm just nodding because I recognize that. And um, perhaps it's because the ego feels it has to defend itself because somewhere it knows that it, it's nothing. Mm -hmm. And in order to, to keep its existence, it, it has to defend itself. And what better way to defend yourself than to perceive attack and attack back? Because that keeps the ball rolling. That's the loop pattern that we're causing. That's yeah. what came to mind. The, the, the ego is the egoic um, thought system is always on the lookout for ways to confirm itself, and an attack, a perceived attack, and attacking itself are perfect ways to do that. And I don't know exactly how that would help then to make the switch if you feel attacked to to make the I haven't I can't dig deep enough to figure it out. <laughs> well, I'm reminded of uh, somebody who was a teacher long ago where he said, go ahead, somebody say something nasty to me and I will show you how I respond. And they said something to him and he went, oh, well, now you know who you're dealing with. <laughs> and then they would say more things and he'd say, mm, I can see your point. Like he never fought back. You know, it was, it was just fun. You had to be there. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's a great point. Because the, the, the ego loves to engage. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and because it's so ingrained, we, we, we feel like if we don't engage, we'll fall in a big hole. Yeah, they'll be, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. And we'll fall in like a, like a vacuum and we can't have that. So you attack back. Well, we are taught to be assertive, you know, in this world. <laughs> so, right. It's a fine line between letting them walk all over you and fighting all the time. You know? the, the thing is, the, the, the example that you gave of, 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 the, of the person who was showing that, if you do that in real life, then there's the trap of becoming cynical. Mm. And you don't want that either. It has, you know, I understand that the gentleman did it in a playful way. Yeah. So, yeah. And so he, he, he got the message across, but if you, if you, if and you I were, remember it all these years later, you know, he yeah, found a way yeah. to yeah. not let it make him mad. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I think when I first read this lesson, I found it hard to, accept and understand that I was, who I was was truly invulnerable. You know, I had to make that shift to, well, who am I? You know, um, from the ego to our essential nature as thought beings or whatever you want to call it, people of the light, I don't know what you would call, or one with God or that we're all one. Um, 
yeah, it was, it was, there was a block there. It was a little hard to accept it. Yeah, I, I think that in one way or another, we, we all have that. We, we, we you're muted. Also, oh, yeah, Audrey, you want to add, you're muted. Yes, oh, you. you know, that the phrase, I love this, I forget who I heard it from, but it just sticks with me because when I say it, it just helps to dissolve the, you know, the whole thing about the other person. And that is what I like say I'm something's happening with the situation, even if it's family, what, what X, whoever it is, what Anna thinks of me is none of my business. <laughs> what blah blah thinks of me is none of my business and that that was helpful for me when when i'm in the times of that separate beings but but what comes to happen too also is that the thought will come and the recognition of the oneness of the other dissolves the 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 attention that I would normally be given to that thought, because now it's starting to right in in um, repurpose. So the 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 whole scene starting off with these, you have to say the separate. What you think of me is none of my business. What you think of me is none of my business. Very helpful, but then the higher level of it is well there isn't another i'm really just thinking this that is thinking i am not thinking there is thinking happening thinking happens it isn't an entity it isn't a separate ego person's thing and and this was very helpful to me too because for a while i was personifying the ego and that I felt like that got me in all kinds of headspace trouble and and really, really <laughs> understanding that, hey, this body comprises a heart, which beats and pumps blood, um, you know, the cells that are regenerating and a mind that thinks. It, it is not its own self or person. It is part of the function of this communication device. I, I feel that at some point there needs to be the leap over into not personifying the ego. And I think that comes as you're vigilant with the thoughts because they aren't you. You, you have to come to that conclusion when when you really are looking i mean you guys you have to there, there's no other conclusion to come to when you see the world reflecting back look at covid like literally we've created i've created the whatever a a, a place where we're literally wearing masks veils masking ourselves from reality and with this disease of COVID, which also some of the symptoms you lose your t taste and your smell. Look, we're knocking off, uh, we're knocking off senses now too with this disease. But hey, maybe when we look back in 20 years, that's going to be a good thing too. We don't know. It's just, <laughs> the whole thing is just, it's, it's, it can become a comedy so so quickly for me anyway <laughs> okay mm -hmm. thank you wonderful share pardon oh uh, oh i thought you were going to I was, say no I, I was but i was so i was listening and i was contemplating what she was saying and i think one of the things that gets confusing sometimes to us as we're studying the course is that so often the course will talk about the ego in personal terms you know it's viciousness it's this and i i couldn't understand if we're if we're trying to get away from associating ourselves with that ego as being because we know it's not real ultimately then why would that be the terminology used and i think it's to make us see 
exactly how we misperceive ourselves and how identified we have become. It's made it into a personal thing when it's really only a mindset. Yeah. And, yeah, when you back away from it, there is a change that happens. And it is which mind you're thinking with. So, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with what Audrey was saying. I, I kind of really, um, yeah, a lot. I, I, I'm going to go all over the place with it because I don't have tied-in thoughts right, right at the moment, which is good. I let them go. I let them go. <laughs> yes, thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. We've come to the top of the hour. Okay. And I'd like to close off with a short prayer, which is um, in lesson 353. I don't have it on the screen, so you'll have to listen or look up in your book if you have it in front of you. 353, the second part of it. Father, I give all things, I'll give all that is mine today to Christ to use in any way that best will serve the purpose that I share with him. Nothing is mine alone, for he and I have joined in purpose. Thus has learning come almost to its appointed end, a while I work with him to serve his purpose. Then I lose myself in my identity and recognize that Christ is but myself. Thank you all for participating, and I hope to see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Love you all. Bye. Thank you Bye. so much. Oh, good. Love it. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs>